All right, welcome to uh, lecture two for July 1st, Wednesday, July 1st, the second lecture for today. All right, so this is the last problem <coughs> that I worked on. Um, so basically for this problem, what we used was something called how the uh, concentration of dissolved gas, which in our case is argon gas, is directly proportional to the partial pressure of argon that is above in the solution, right? And then we can remove the proportionality sign by using something called Henry's constant KH. And we talked about what are the units for Henry's constant. And then we use this formula to solve this problem. All right, so now the next topic that we're gonna move on is something called Collisative property. All right, so what does that term even mean? All right, this, there are some properties, right? So what happens is, let's say if I have a beaker of water, right? So let's say I'm at one atmosphere pressure. Right, so let's say the external pressure is about one atm right when i hit this water up you know that the boiling point of water is 100 degrees celsius right now what happens let's see if i put one tablespoon of this is five for right now so i'm going to show five tablespoon of a salt so let's say NaCl, right? And I'm doing the same thing over there. On the beaker, same amount of water. Instead of five tablespoons, let's just say I put 10 in this one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Right? Then when I try to heat this both up, right? So what is, something's gonna happen, this, for this solution, the water might boil at, let's say, 102 degrees Celsius, right? For this solution, the water might boil at 103.5 degrees Celsius, All right? So now, something that has happened is, is called boiling point elevation. All right, so basically, what you should have realized here, right, is in this example, I had only five teaspoon of salt, whereas in this, I had 10 teaspoon of the same salt. Like remember, I'm comparing apples and apples, all right? And then the boiling point was elevated, right? From 100 degrees Celsius to this. But something that you should have noticed, right, is this property, the boiling point, depended upon the number of solid particles that dissolved in that water. So this is what colligative property means, all right? Is, I wonder do you pronounce colligative or colligative? Oh, I'll have to look that up. All right, so basically it's the property of solution, since we're talking about solution here, right? That depends primarily on the number of solutes that has dissolved in it, all right? Rather than the kind of solid particles. And there are four collegiate properties that we're going to talk about. The first one is called vapor pressure and how it is lowered whenever we add solid particle to a solvent. Then we're going to talk about boiling point elevation, right? The example that I just gave over here. All right. Next one is freezing point depression. Example, 
that you might be familiar with is think about why do you think they sprinkle salt during winter on roads, right? And some of you might even sprinkle some salt in your driveway, right? So think about that. Yes, that is where this freezing point depression comes into play. And finally, this concept called osmotic pressure, right? As to how the number of solid particles that has dissolved in the solvent affects the osmotic pressure, right? And then we're going to use different formulas to kind of calculate the boiling point elevation, boiling point, freezing point depression, and so on. All right, so let's look at the first one, this concept called vapor pressure, all right? What happens to vapor pressure whenever you add salt to it? This is a good example, right? So here you have a solvent, right? So let's just say this solvent is a little volatile. Again, okay, remember volatile means something which has a low boiling point, right? Or which has high vapor pressure. We define that as a volatile solvent. All right. And then volatile solvent means <coughs> you have this molecule of this solvent, right, in the liquid form as well as this molecule of the solvent in the uh, vapor form. And this is what is causing the vapor pressure, right, to arise in the first place. All right, so this is at dynamic equilibrium. That means think about this, the rate of evaporation is the same as rate of condensation. And that's how we had defined dynamic equilibrium. All right, so now what I'm going to do is to the same amount of solvent, I'm going to add some glucose. In this picture, I have shown glucose by this green particles. So let's say I dissolve this glucose, all right? All right, I add it, I stir it, and then I want you to think about what happens in the dynamic equilibrium. Do you think the vapor pressure, right? Because remember, the way we are defined vapor pressure is how much pressure are these papers of the solvent exerting on the wall of this container? Do you think the vapor pressure of uh, the solution, if that helps you, all right, is it going to be more or less in figure C? All right. So remember, whenever you added glucose to that picture all right for b what's gonna happen is the thing about this right is i have shown some pictures so do you see how, how i have shown this vapor form of the solvent kind of going back and what's gonna happen is So what's gonna happen is these glucose molecules are gonna think about this as pull these vapor molecules towards itself. So think about some kind of attraction, all right? And that is one of the reasons the vapor pressure of the solution decreases whenever you add a solute. Or on the rationale that I have seen in some of the book, it's pretty, um, I think that you can use that rational as well, right? So think about this, right? So whenever you have these glucose particles, so think about these glucose particles are going to be crowded and they're going to block the solvent particles from going into the vapor phase. And if that happens, that will decrease the vapor pressure above the solution. All right. So think about this. That's why the vapor pressure of a solution of glucose, right? So right here. So let's just say that was my just pure water. So this is my pure water. Right, whereas this is my solution of glucose.
right? So what I'm telling you is the vapor pressure above the water, which is due to all these water vapor molecules, is less here in a solution of glucose than in pure water. So that's what a lowering of vapor pressure means. That's the first collegiative property. All right. Now, Raoult's law kind of explains that, right, as to what happens to the vapor pressure above the solution. Right? On the word, he uses the term partial pressure, right? Whenever you add a solute, or even he has extended, which are, we're going to see in a problem that I'm going to work on, as to what happens, right? Let's say if you have two solutions that you have mixed, let's say two solvents that you have mixed, can we calculate the vapor pressure of those individual solvent that's above that solution or not, All right? So what does Raoult's law say? It's said in this formula right here. This is Raoult's law. All right, so let's just say you have a closed container, you have particle A here, as well as you have particle B, so two different particles that has made up this solution, right? Or molecule A, if you want to call it, and molecule B, two different molecules, all right? Both of these are going to exert some pressure, right? So I'm going to, how about this? For particle B, I'm going to do it in, in green, right? So they're going to have some vapor form over here for particle B, and then they are going to have some vapor or particularly of the solution, all right? So what Raoult's law says, we can find the partial pressure of component A by using this formula, or even same thing, right? doesn't matter. It can be partial pressure of component B if I know the, I'm going to explain what that XA, XB is. And what does this not means? What is this sign means? All right. So what does he say is the partial pressure of a component A above the solution is equals to, now this is where I'm going to divide, define this term. All right. Is equal to the mole fraction of that component. So this term right here, it's called mole fraction. Remember in my earlier slide, we talked about molality, molarity, and then mole fraction as some of the units of concentration in chemistry. So this is the third concentration unit that I'm gonna introduce to you, mole fraction. That means the partial pressure of A, right, above the solution, equals to the mole fraction of A times this right here, all right, is the vapor pressure when, or vapor pressure of pure component A. So anytime you see this, dot, they are trying to refer to the pure component, all right? In, the next couple of slides, we're going to see something like this, right? So we're going to see temperature of water, and they might use this a boiling point of water, and then they might use this dot sign above or degree sign. All right. So what is telling you is the boiling point of water when it's just water or a boiling point of pure water. Same thing here. What I'm telling you is that is defining the vapor pressure of pure component A when there's nothing mixed in it, right? And that's why this formula, partial pressure is by any component. And here I've defined that component as A equals to the vapor pressure of the pure component, which is PA naught, right, or PA degree. I'm going to start using the PA degree for it, multiplied by its mole fraction XA. 
right? Now I use the term ideal solution right here. Right. So basically, the concept behind ideal solution is kind of uh, goes along with the line of ideal gas that you learned in KM 115. Again, the idea behind ideal solution, yes, first thing, it has to obey the Raoult's law. All right. And then when you have an ideal solution, what we are doing is we're ignoring the intermolecular interactions that's happening between PA and PB. Right? Because let's say PA is let's say water, right, which has hydrogen bond, whereas if PB is another solvent which doesn't have hydrogen bond, do you see what I mean? So those are different kind of intermolecular forces coming into play. But what we're saying is, and in either solution, we're ignoring those, those intermolecular interaction. All right. Now, since we defined, I defined the term molar fraction, let's work through some problems as to how you can find molar fractions and so on. All right, then we'll work through some couple of examples of Raoult's law. All right, so easy way to think about this, right, is basically <clears throat> more fraction of A equals to number of moles of A divided by, so I'm just going to write down total number of moles of all the other components that are present in that system. So this could go on, right? So there could be like, all right, total number of moles of A only divided by total number of moles of all the other components that are present. All right, so easy way to think about this. The denominator is think about that as the total number of moles that are present. And one thing to keep in mind, the mole fraction always has the value between zero and one. Really important to keep in mind. Now, if you calculate the mole fraction, if you got greater than one means you did something wrong. If you calculate the value of mole fraction, and if you got a value less than zero means that's wrong. All right, so basically, say the way I wrote that formula, you can write that in this way as well, right? Most of solute, or you can write most of substance, whatever is easy for you, right? Since I'm talking about, let's say, something that's dissolved in a solvent, that's why I use most of solute, which is talking about the Na divided by total moles present. Now something you should have noticed, right? My numerator, my numerator has a unit of moles. My denominator also has a unit of moles. And that's why my mole fraction is unitless. So mole fraction does not have any units since it is a ratio of two moles. All right. All right. So now let's calculate some of this mole fractions problem. Let's work through some of these mole fractions problem. Right. So this solution is made by mixing. So you have this beaker. You have a solution. All right. So let's do some of these are red, and some of these are less. No, orange to blue. Right. So let's just say the red is chloroform. Is the black. Red is chloroform. And the blue one is, most other one, we have chloroform and ester bromide. All right, so I'm just gonna call ester bromide as AB to help my to help my life easy. All right, I'm just gonna write down, the, I'm just gonna write an AB for ester bromide. So what is this telling you is, right, you are mixing these two liquid, right? Chloroform and ester bromide, all right? Then it's asking me, what is the mole fraction of chloroform, all right? All right, so first thing that I'm gonna do, and then whenever you're working on this problems on Alex, all right? Uh, first thing you need to know is since I need the number of moles of 112 grams of chloroform as well as since that 50 gram of estobromide to number of moles, that tells me I should know the molar mass of both those molecules. You can Google it up. It's up to you. Or you, if you want to calculate, just calculate the individual atomic mass. 
a molar mass of all these atoms, making sure that you take into account the total number of atoms as well, because you have three of them, right? And then you can calculate the molar mass. So whenever I Google it for my chloroform, which I'm going to start calling CHCl3, CHCl3, because that's the chemical formula, all right? CHCl3, I found it to have 100 and 19.38 grams of CSCl3 is present in one mole. Whereas for the ester bromide, it was 122.95 grams per mole, which I Googled it because I was lazy to calculate the atomic mass or molar mass to be exact. All right, so the first thing that I'm going to do is. I'm going to calculate the number of moles of chloroform because since I have to, to find the mole fraction of chloroform, my formula is going to look like this, right? So that's the mole fraction of chloroform, CHCl3 equals to number of moles of chloroform divided by total number of moles, right? But since in my solution I have chloroform and ester bromide, I'm going to do something like this. My total number of moles is going to be number of moles of CHCl3 plus number of moles of AB, which is stands for acetyl bromide right here, AB. Because this part right here just gives me the total number of moles in the solution. Total moles. All right. All right, now to find the moles of chloroform, the first thing that I'll have to do is find the number of moles of both of these, right? CHCl3 and NAB. So let's go ahead and do that, right? To find the number of moles of CHCl3, I have been given the mass as 112 gram of this. And then I just told you this is the molar mass of chloroform. If I do my math, I'm going to end up with 0 0.938. Moles. That's the number of moles of chloroform. CHCl3 is chloroform. I'm going to do the same thing for my ester bromide. To find the number of moles of ester bromide, I've been given the mass of ester bromide as 54 gram. And my molar mass of this is 122.95 grams per mole. And if I do my math, I'm going to end up with 0 0.439 moles. Right, so that means the first thing that I did was I converted the mass of each individual solid if you want to call it right or component that we present in this solution right first i found the number of moles of chloroform and i found the number of moles of ester bromide now i'm going to just plug that formula here in that formula right i have the number of moles of chloroform as 0 0.938 moles divided by 0 0.938 moles Plus, first number of moles of ester bromide, I calculate that at 0 0.439 mole. You add these two up and then 0 0.938 divided by, by that number, I'm going to end up with 0 0.681. And remember, right, like I told you, the mole and mole gets cancelled, right? This mole is in the numerator and whenever you add these two moles you're going to get that unit in moles as well so in the end all those moles are going to get cancelled and that's why i'm telling you mole fraction is unitless all right now for your knowledge sake and again whenever you're working through this right what I've been doing is I've been giving you for knowledge sake kind of similar problems. So in the knowledge sake eight, I'm asking you to find the molar mole fraction of acetyl bro bromide. So 
ethyl bromide, the AB thing for this problem. And if I were you, I would look at this problem, what, how I explain, right? Great, but then whenever we are we are working for the mole fraction of ethyl bromide, try to do it without looking at my numbers and see if you can figure it out. All right. So I hope this makes sense. All right. So now as to why I asked you to be comfortable calculating the mole fraction, because for Ralph's law, a formula that we had earlier written was let's say pressure of component A was equals to molar fraction of A times the pure pressure of A. Right? People pure vapor pressure of A, right? Whereas this PA was the vapor pressure of A above the solution. All right. That's why the first thing you had to know was how to calculate the mole fraction here. And that's why I went to that example of mole fraction. All right. So now let's see how to work through this problem now. So at a certain temperature, the vapor pressure of pure is still bromide. So it's the AB that we talked about in our earlier slide, acetyl bromide. So I'm going to use the same short form for acetyl bromide. So the pure vapor pressure of acetyl bromide has been provided to us. And then what they are saying is they are going to prepare a solution by mixing 62.4 gram of acetyl bromide and 82.3 grams of heptane. So now in our case here, I'm just going to draw the picture here but then solve it in the whiteboard because I don't have enough space here, right? So think about this, right? So I have, and all these examples, remember, these are all closed containers. So I have this particle. I'm going to start calling that. This is my acetyl bromide. And then it says like, the solution is prepared by mixing some of heptane as well, right? So there is some of this heptane as well. All right, so this is my heptane. Now remember, both of these solvents, if you want to call it, right, are going to have some vapor form over here, right? You're going to have some vapor form of heptane on top of the solution as well as vapor form of acetyl bromide which is in brown i hope you can see it right so the green ones over on top of the solution is a pure vapor of heptane the brown one of the solution right these brown little ones that you, you hopefully you'll be able to see but let me just do this how about this these brown ones this brown ones are all vapor that i'm trying to draw all right the brown ones are for the acetyl bromide the green ones are the papers or heptane. All right. So what they're asking us, right, is calculate the partial pressure of acetyl bromide vapor solution. So they're asking the partial pressure of acetyl bromide on top of the solution. And that is what our Rao's law say, right? Because if I know this values, if I know the mole fraction of my acetyl bromide, I'm just going to call it acetyl bromide. If I know the mole fraction of my acetyl bromide, if I know the vapor pressure of pure acetyl bromide, then I can find the vapor pressure of or partial pressure of acetyl bromide above the solution. All right. So now let us start writing what we know. And then I'm going to use whiteboard because I don't think I have enough space here. Skip. Come on. Skip. All right. So let's write down what has been given to us, right? So first, let's go ahead and write the formula really quick, right? Because I'm trying to find the P of acetyl bromide right, of the solution. And I told you the formula is partial pressure of acetyl bromide times the vapor pressure of pure, so,
All right. So this right here is the paper pressure of pure pure crystal bromide. That's the mole fraction of crystal bromide, and we learn how to. And this is the partial pressure or the vapor pressure above the solution, right? That we're trying to find out. Now that pressure is read by stud bromide though. And this is what we're trying to find out, right? The first thing, let us go ahead and find the mole fraction of stud bromide. That's the first thing we're gonna do, all right? And we're gonna use the same method that we used earlier right first i'm going to find the number of moles of ischel bromide i have been given the mass of ischel bromide as 62.4 gram right and then the molar mass of ab ischel bromide mm is transfer molar mass of ischel bromide is 122.95 grams per mole And then for heptin, I'm just call it HEP for heptin. Is 100.20 grams per mole. All right, so first thing that I'm gonna do, similar to how we solved the mole fraction problem, right? Because remember, my first goal I'm trying to do is figure out the mole fraction of AB. So for that, I'm showing you how to find the mole fraction of AB, right? I'm gonna convert this. 122.95. Let me erase this. I think I'll be able to see clearly. Right, so that gives the number of moles of crystal bromide. It's 0 0.5075. Right now, I'm just going to include up to like four, five, six figs. And later we'll worry about the number of six six. All right, if we have to, if the question asks me. Because remember, now I have to find the for to find the mole fraction of ester bromide. I do need the most number of moles of heptane as well, right? Let me figure out the number of moles of heptane. And the mass of heptane that is given to me is eighty two point three gram. And my molar mass for heptin is 100.20 grams per mole. I do my math, I'm going to end up with 0 0.8213 moles. Right, so from these two values, I can find the molar fraction of crystal bromide because what we said, my formula for that is number of moles of crystal bromide divided by total number of moles now to find total number of moles all i need to do is add the number of moles of crystal bromide plus number of moles of heptane so everything has been given to me 0 0.5075 mole divided by 0 0.5075 plus 0 0.8213 mole Right now, the mole and mole gets cancelled. That's why I've been telling you this is unitless. That means the molar fraction of crystal bromide is 0 0.38192. Let's go up to here. All right. Now, all I have to do is look at my formula that I'm going to use. Right. I'm going to use a multi trick. Yeah. Okay. And what I had said was my pressure over the solution for ester bromide equals to partial fraction of AB ester bromide times pure vapor pressure of AB. All right, so now this is something that's unknown, right? I do not know this PAB. I just calculated my 
faster pressure of AB and the value came to be 0 0.3819 which is unitless and this paper pressure of pure ester bromide has been given to me as uh, 0 0.68 atm and look at that I know everything right that means I can easily calculate my pressure I know this I know this that means it's going to be equals to 0 0.3819 times 0 0.68 atm Unit list times ATM should give you the unit of ATM, which is good because that's the partial pressure of the solution. All right, so in the end, my answer is going to be after sig fix, taking into account sig fix, I have to report my answer to sig fix because uh, this dictates, right? Only two significant figures here tells me that my final answer should have only two sig fix. So that's why my final answer is 0 0.26 ATM. All right, so think about that as the partial pressure of ester bromide above the solution. I, in other words, you can think about that as this has partial pressure, partial pressure of vapor acetyl bromide above the solution. All right. So in this picture, if you think about this, oh, should I take it? Okay, no, I. All right, so in other way, what I was trying to tell you is, let's see if I have a beaker. Let me draw this as black. So if I have a beaker here, this is enclosed, right? So this is the level of the solution, all right? So this is the liquid. Acetyl bromide, right? That was mixed with heptin. This is my heptin. Then remember, right? These solvents at a certain temperature, at the temperature given in the problem, right? They do vaporize off. So I'm going to draw something like this. This is showing the vapor of heptin. Whereas the red one is showing the vapor of acetyl bromide. So what you calculated this in this problem, the PAB, right, is the pressure exerted by these vapor acetyl bromide. That's it. The PAB that you calculated is the pressure exerted by the vapor acetyl bromide above this solution. All right, by using Ralph's law, right? R A O U L T S law, which is this. Friends, all right. So we can get the vapor pressure. All right. I'm just gonna kind of start on this and. I'm hoping I'll be able to. Yeah, I think I think I should be able to finish it by tomorrow. All right. So that way, at least I'm. I'll start describing how to find the Van't Hoff factor for you all. All right. So the problems that we worked on, the Rouse law. All right, was the first causative property we looked at. Right. We looked at how the vapor pressure pressure decreases in a solution so this was the first one we looked at lowering of paper pressure right number one now the next one we're going to look at is boiling point elevation and freezing point depression that's the second and the third causative property but the good thing about this formula for boiling point elevation and freezing point depression they are similar that's why I'm going to kind of mix them up and I'll only work through one of the problems. And trust me, they are the same, all right? But for both of them, so beside, beside that, right? So when we dissolve, let's say sodium chloride in water, 
right? And we said that, yes, the vapor pressure is lowered whenever you add sodium chloride to water, all right? And that's why we said that the collisionary properties, they are directly proportional to the concentration of solid particles, right? And that's why they are called collisionary properties, right? All right. Now, whenever we talk about all these causative properties, right, lowering of vapor pressure, the boiling point elevation, freezing point elevation, the electrolytes have a greater effect than non-electrolytes. So really quickly, a review from K115. What does electrolyte means and what does non-electrolyte, all right? So an electrolyte is any substance. Let's see if I have this molecule AB. If I dissolve this in water, and, oh my God, why did you do that? If I have AB, and if I dissolve this in water, pure liquid, right? And if it breaks apart into counter cation, and then counter anion, we call that as an electrolyte all right but if you have a non-electrolyte like glucose and sugar so let's just say non-electrolyte as i'm just going to call it cd let's just say my my molecule was cd right i put it in water and if it does not dissociate into its cations and anions but stay as it is we call it as non-electrolyte. And what you might have learned in 15 is electrolytes are a good conductor of electricity, whereas non-electrolyte, they do not conduct electricity. All right, so example, glucose is an example of a non-electrolyte, right? because it does not dissociate into cations and anions, whereas sodium chloride, NaCl, does break into Na plus and Cl minus. That's why it is called as electrolyte. Right? So I hope, and electrolyte, non electrolyte, I'm definitely going to ask you a question about that in exam one. All right, so one thing, again, so whenever I dissolve one mole of glucose, since it does not break apart, right? My result is one mole of solid particles. That means one mole of non-electrolyte gives me one mole of solid particles. But guess what? If I have one mole of sodium chloride, remember the sodium chloride breaks into Na plus and Cl minus. That means one mole of this and one mole of this, that are total, total of two moles of solid particles. All right, so I hope this makes sense. All right, so now I said we're going to talk about the boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. All right, so this is the last graph I'm going to talk about for today, and I'm going to end today's class. All right, is basically what I mean by that. All right, so let's look at this uh, graph. And then we'll talk about the boiling point elevation, the Vanta factor, and all the problems associated with that in tomorrow's class, all right? So if I look at this graph, now this right here is for water. This graph right here is for water. Now let me change it in color. Uh, red. All right, so this graph is for pure water, all right? And you know that water's freezing point, Fp for freezing point, it's zero degrees Celsius. So in other term, that's the temperature where the liquid water changes to ice water. All right. Now look at this temperature zero degrees Celsius. This is the freezing point. All right. Now let's say if I add some salt to water, let's say something like sodium chloride. All right. Uh, sodium chloride might not give this kind of a drastic <laughs> freezing point depression, but look at what has happened. All right, is 
do you see this temperature now went from zero all the way to let's say negative 38 degrees celsius now instead of water let's say that this that is close to negative 30 degrees celsius. instead of water freezing at 30 degrees celsius by adding solute to it right the non-volatile solute i decreased the freezing point of water and that is called the freezing point depression and this is the principle which people use whenever they sprinkle some salt on road whenever there is snow all right or whenever we're going to have ice storm this is the principle behind it right they use some kind of a salt that depresses the freezing point of water that way you're not walking on slick ice all right now this right here this point right here and one thing that i forgot to tell you right so the y-axis is talking about the external pressure and this right here this point that i'm talking about right all these look at this point these are all at 1 atm and that's the normal atmosphere right so that's the 1 atm all right and that's why this zero degrees which was the freezing point of water tf degree look at that and this is the freezing point of pure water that's why they use the term degree to define that all right it went down to final temperature the freezing point got depressed now for this look at this the tb degree is the boiling point of water and we know that boiling point of water at 1 atm is 100 degrees celsius and that's why look at this this is exactly 100 degrees celsius all right now what i'm going to do is i'm going to add some solute all right to this water and guess what the boiling point of water is going to go up all the way to about let's say 110 degrees celsius right this point right here is 110 degrees celsius so this part right here that i saw this is called the freezing point depression and this part right here it's called the boiling point elevation all right so the two phrases that i want to be comfortable with right at least not the phrase the terms which i'm going to use tomorrow tf versus tf degree versus tb versus tb degree all right now the tf degree is the freezing point of pure water that's why this degree sign here tb degree is the boiling point of pure water that's why the degree sign now after i add the solute the freezing point is gonna decrease that's why this is the new final temperature right and this is the new final boiling point of water this was the new final freezing point of that solution rather than saying water let's just say that solution right because after you add solute that water becomes a solution right that pure water becomes a solution so again this is talking about the pure water both of these right whereas both of these two are talking about solution after you added the solute all right so again a couple of things to mind keep in mind that's why the boiling point of a solution which has a non-volatile solid, right? So whenever they say non-volatile solid, they're talking about salts, S-A-L-T, right? Or let's say sugars, is always greater than the boiling point of pure water, which is what you saw here, right? Boiling point of solution is higher than the boiling point of pure water. Whereas the boiling point of a solution is always lower than the sorry not boiling point the freezing point of a solution tf is always less than the freezing point of pure water and again i have been spending lots of time on these graphs right so you understand what this graph is about so expect exam one two three to have lots of questions conceptual questions based on this graph all right so if you write your notes organize it 
so that you understand, oh, this is what's happening. All right, because remember, your exams are open, ex open notes and open book. All right, I'm going to stop here, and then tomorrow we're going to do some calculations based on boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, and so on. All right, hope you all have a good Wednesday. And then I'll see you or you'll hear me talking tomorrow.